Open your Bibles, please, to John. I fooled you, didn't I? John chapter 15. John chapter 15. I want to start here because we're actually going to be going to a couple of passages of Scripture that just make a whole new sense out of what we're looking at in Acts chapter 4. And we'll get to the recap on that story in just a minute. But before this, we have to go back a few weeks, several weeks actually, probably a few months, and Jesus, as he was meeting with his disciples, who would become his apostles, what's the difference? Disciples are discipled and apostles, they're ambassadors. They go out and they represent him. That's the deal of being an apostle. So he meets with them after the Last Supper in the same room, and he gives them his last words before he's arrested, put on trial, and goes to the cross. And among those words, as he's beginning to wrap up what he's saying, in John chapter 15, verse 18, Jesus says to his disciples this, If the world hates you, keep in mind that it hated me first. You know, with all that's going on in the world today, us Christians say, I wonder why all this is happening. It's Jesus. You say, but Jesus is such a glorious, wonderful person to me. He's more than I, could, I can contain in words. It's true. But it doesn't mean the world likes him. The world still hates him. And keep in mind that it hated me first, Jesus said. If you belong to the world... It would love you as its own, as it is you do not belong to the world. But I have chosen you out of the world. That is why the world hates you. Remember the words I spoke to you. No servant is greater than his master. If they persecuted me, they will persecute you also. If they obeyed my teaching, they will obey yours also. They will treat you this way because of my name. Keep that in mind. For they do not know the one who sent me. If I had not come and spoken to them, they would not be guilty of sin. Now, however, they have no excuse for their sin. He who hates me hates my father as well. If I had not done among them what no one else did, they would not be guilty of sin. But now they have seen miracles, these miracles, and yet they have hated both me and my father. But this is to fulfill what is written in their law. They hated me without reason. Now listen, here it comes. That's all bad news. Wow, you know, they hate me, they're going to hate you. If they listen to me, they're going to listen to you. But still, they're going to hate you, and don't be surprised by this, Jesus says. Then he says this, when the counselor comes, who's that? Holy Spirit. Spirit, Whom I will send to you from the Father, the Spirit of truth, who goes out from the Father, he will testify about me. That's the work of the Holy Spirit. He does so much. The Holy Spirit. I mean, if you look at the ministry of Jesus, so interesting, things that we can't quantify, we can't explain it in any logical form. People have been trying since Jesus was on this earth. The bottom line is we can't explain how one man could be entirely God and yet entirely man at the same time. And how is it that Jesus, being in human form, he's got a human body, and yet he's all God, he also is capable of knowing what he knows, doing what he did, the miracles, the words, everything else. You say, boy, that's because he's Jesus. Well, yes, and. It's because if you watch, he didn't go into ministry, as you read the scripture, until the Holy Spirit came upon him at his baptism. 
He had done no miracles and he had done no sermons that anybody knows of in that sense anyway. And we know that he hadn't done miracles because after his baptism, he changed his water to wine and, he, and, and that was after his baptism. And John even said that was his first. That was his first. What's the point? The same Holy Spirit who came upon Jesus is upon you. You want to know what the Holy Spirit is capable of through you? Look at Jesus. Will he do the exact same things? No. He's going to do what he wants to do, what he decides to do. That's his prerogative. But you are filled, overflowing with that same Holy Spirit. How did God fully man do the things of God the same way that you, fully human, can do the things of God? By the Holy Spirit. He was with us. He's in us. He flows through us because he came upon us. That's what the Bible teaches. Say, what happened to me as a Christian? That happened to you as a Christian. What makes you a Christian? Not that you just do what Jesus did. There's a lot of people in this world that claim to that that were entirely wicked people. What makes us true followers of Jesus Christ is the Holy Spirit in you. And the work of the Holy Spirit through us makes us look like him. And the world sees Jesus through you. And people are ministered to in this room by Jesus through you. Oh, we can do it in supernatural ways, boom, you know, just, you know, lightning from heaven kind of thing. But it's still supernatural because he's flowing through us. He's flowing through you to each other. He, when he does these things, the Holy Spirit speaks of Jesus. When the gifts are at work, how many times I've said this, but remember it. When the gifts are at work, when the Holy Spirit is moving, he's always pointing to Jesus. Why? Because Jesus shows us the Father. You get the whole package when the Holy Spirit is working. When is the Holy Spirit being abused? You can tell because a guy is glorified. A, a procedure is glorified. A church is glorified. Something is entertainment, Christian entertainment. It's kind of glorified. When the Holy Spirit is work, people go, isn't Jesus amazing? It was him. Look at that. Because that's what the Spirit does. Now, I wanted to point that out. Let me keep on reading. We're going to jump into Acts. When the Counselor comes, who I will send to you from the Father, the Spirit of truth who goes out from the Father, he will testify about me. But you also must testify, he tells his disciples. For you have been with me from the beginning. You've got something to say, and you must say it. You're going to have help. You're going to have all the help you need, more than you need. You're going to have the Holy Spirit. I'm sending him to you. But you've been with me. You must testify. For chapter 16. All this I have told you so that you will not go astray. Why? Because the pressure is going to be on. Things are going to happen. Verse 2, they will put you out of the synagogue. That was the worst possible fate for a Jew in those days, by the way. In fact, a time is coming when anyone who kills you will think he is offering a service to God. I'm going to stop right there. Because now it starts to happen. Acts chapter 4. Acts chapter 4. Peter and John, as you well know, because we've spent ample time talking about the miracle where they're going up into the temple to pray by the beautiful gate. They see a crippled man. The man asks for money. Peter and John look down, and Peter grabs him by the hand and says, Silver and gold have I not, but such as I have I give to you. In the name of Jesus Christ of Nazareth, rise and walk. He pulls him to his feet. The man is healed, walking and leaping and praising God, and Peter gathers this huge crowd and does exactly what was expected of him by God, empowered by God. He gives another sermon. 
first one in Acts chapter 2, this one now in Acts chapter 3. It's very similar to the Acts 2 sermon, and he's getting the people just all, well, just, he, he, man, the Holy Spirit is working through them, and they're pricked to the heart because he's telling them, you helped kill the Messiah, but guess what? God forgives sinners. Really? And he was really the Messiah, and he proved it. And here's how, and he's going on and on. And then finally, he says, verse 26 of chapter 3, when God raised up his servant, that's Jesus, he sent him first to you to bless you by turning each of you from your wicked ways. And we spent a lot of time talking about that. Remember, that's a remarkable passage, because who's he talking to? Religious people. Turn you, religious people, from your wicked ways. They're the first people to say, we're not wicked, we're doing everything right. Well, <laughs> other people were listening. The priests and the captain of the temple guard and the Sadducees came up to Peter and John while they were speaking to the people. We talked a bit about them last week, so we'll leave that. If you want to go back and listen to the, to the, uh, uh, the sermon online, you can do that. They were guilty, they were greatly disturbed, rather, because the apostles were teaching the people and proclaiming in Jesus the resurrection of the dead. Remember, this sect known as the Sadducees, there were lots of different Jewish sects. The Pharisees, you've heard about. The scribes, you've heard about. The Sadducees, well, Caiaphas, Annas, and the whole priestly order that ran the Temple Mount were Sadducees. And then there were others, Herodians and, and, and the Essenes and people like that that we don't talk about very often. But there were all these different Jewish sects, but the ones that ran the show, once again, were the Sadducees. And the Sadducees believed in God, believed in the law. They were very devout. But they were also what we would call naturalists or perhaps secularists. Say, why? They believed in God. They believed in the law. They did not believe in heaven, hell, a resurrection, life after death, or judgment. If you don't believe in any of that, you can get away with murder. Literally. And they did. These are the guys that railroaded Jesus to the cross. Not that the Pharisees didn't like him. Not that the Pharisees didn't want to see him dead. But it was the Sadducees that got him with Pilate on the cross. And these guys are ticked because here comes G, uh, P, uh, Peter, rather, and he's preaching the resurrection. The resurrection is going to happen. Jesus rose from the dead, never to die again. That's a resurrection, by the way. Once again, we throw out that term resurrection a lot, but we tend to think of it as a bit of an abstract or a mystery. Understand this, one day you will experience the resurrection of the dead. Your soul, unless it happens in our lifetime, that's what the rapture is. It's the resurrection contingency. You don't have to be dead to get raptured. Yeah, it's good. I like that. Okay. So, you, a person who dies, who has faith in Christ, who has received his salvation, no matter what happened to their body, God has no problem bringing all those atoms back together again. If he can create a universe out of nothing, he can easily put your body back together any way he wants. And there will come a day when there will be that shout, that trumpet blast from the Lord, and the dead in Christ will rise. That is the bodily resurrection of the saints or Christians, okay? No matter what you know, Apostles' Creed you're reading or a Nicene Creed or something like that, it always ends with this thing, that this is going to happen. It's so important. It's going to occur. And we don't know when it's going to occur. It is a surprise day. we got to be ready for it. But that's if we're alive. If you're dead, the bodies come out, they're reassembled. But here's the deal about the bodies. They come back together again, never to die again. Soul is reunited with the body in heaven. They can live in the environment of heaven. They can live in the environment of the earth. They can stand before the presence of God, which right now you can't do, not in our present condition. We have human bodies that are perishing. If you're alive, remember, people say, well, I don't believe in the rapture of the church. You'd better. Because that's what Paul talks about over there in 1 Corinthians 15, and over in Galatians, uh, uh, Galatians, excuse me, 1 Thessalonians uh, chapter 4, talks about it there, that here was the problem. What if the resurrection of the dead happens and you're alive at the time? 
you will, who are alive at that time, you will be changed in a moment, a twinkling of an eye. You'll be caught up in the air to meet them. So in other words, we get resurrection bodies. We just don't have to die first. Isn't that cool? Amen. So with all of that in mind, these guys are preaching the resurrection of the dead. But here's how they're doing it. They're saying it's going to happen. The Sadducees are furious because they don't believe in it. By the way, later on in the book of Acts, we have a little incident that Paul pulls off that is absolutely brilliant about the resurrection in front of the Sadducees. You're going to love it. Read ahead. That'll get you reading your Bibles, right? So read ahead. <laughs> but the resurrection began with Jesus. Because when Jesus came out of that tomb, he came out never to die again. That is the resurrection of the dead. And it started with Jesus. That's why he's called the firstborn from the dead. That's why he initiated the resurrection of the dead. Well, why hasn't it been happening? Because it's not God's time yet. But when it is time, Jesus was the first one to rise from the dead. And what that does is that it proves to all of us, unequivocally, that this will happen. If there was ever doubt in anybody's mind that there was not going to be a resurrection, Jesus proved otherwise. There will be, look at me, I came out of that tomb, I rose from the dead, there will be a resurrection. He ascended to be with his father. He's not dead, he's not dying, he will never die again. Peter is preaching this. The Sadducees are in charge of the temple courts and the temple itself. And Peter is preaching this on their territory. And they don't like it. Peter's preaching. He gets interrupted by these guys. He didn't get a chance to do the altar call. Altar calls were only invented about 150 years ago, by the way. So he's proclaiming the resurrection of the dead. Verse 3. They seized Peter. These are not Roman soldiers. These are temple police. They're different, but they also have a great deal of authority, and they're, they're tough guys. They see, seized Peter and John. John is right there with him. And because it was evening, they put them in jail until the next day. It was evening. So Peter, between the time that he heals the man who was lame, about three in the afternoon, that was the time of prayer, that they would be going, it tells us in the earlier chapter. About three in the afternoon, the crowd gathers. How long did that take? Peter begins to preach. How long did that take? They arrest them. Now the sun is going down. There's no time to have a trial, and they don't want to do that. So they put them in jail until the next day. Verse 4. But many who heard the message believed, and the number of men grew to about 5,000. That doesn't include wives and children, servants, and anybody else. So at least 5,000 people right there in Jerusalem. Once again, the church is beginning to explode and expand right there in Jerusalem. The next day, verse 5, the rulers, the elders, and teachers of the law met in Jerusalem. Annas, the high priest, was there, and so was Caiaphas, John, Alexander, and other men of the high priest's family, all Sadducees. There really, really mad. They had Peter and John brought before them and began to question them. By what power or what name did you do this? <sighs> Can you imagine being Peter and John? They are standing before at least part of, if not the entire, same council that put Jesus on trial and then railroaded him to the cross. Hmm, I wonder if we're next. Now, remember that Peter and John also fled. They deserted Jesus on the night that he was betrayed. Judas comes, gives him a kiss, He's now descended upon by all these temple police, probably the same guys that arrested him right there. Probably the same guards. They weren't Romans. They come in and they grab him. Same guys. They take him before a council, kangaroo courts, before they put him on trial before Pilate, which was different. Same guys. 
now they're standing there. I wonder what they're going to do to us. Remember, Peter and John fled. In fact, because Jesus was arrested, carried off by the same temple police, put in front of the same Jewish leaders, these Sadducees, these high priests of the temple, Annas being a retired high priest but still had sway over the other high priests because, frankly, it was all politics. And Peter and John, that night when Jesus was arrested, wouldn't even get close. Peter and John followed, quote-unquote, at a distance. Everyone else headed for the hills. Peter and John were about as loyal as you're going to get. John got close, and you'd also find John bold enough to get at the cross as Jesus is dying. He's there because Jesus addresses him from the cross. John stuck close, but he still fled. Every last one of them fled that night. Peter stayed with John because John knew somebody in the high priest's family. You say, how did he know that? He's a fisherman from Galilee. What does a fisherman do with his fish? He sells it. Probably sold fish to the high priest's family. We really don't know any other reason why he would know the high priest. So because he knows the high priest's family, Peter and John go into the courtyard of a high priest's house while Jesus is on trial. And Peter begins to warm himself by the fire. We don't know exactly what John was doing, but he was listening and he was watching. And as Peter is warming himself by the fire, he's asked or told three times, Hey, you're one of them. You were with him. Another person, I can tell by your accent, you're a Galilean. You know, Galileans, they kind of talk like that. You know, so I can tell where you're from. You're not from around here. And then lastly, a little girl said, I saw you, you were with him. And he said, I don't know the man. And he begins to call curses down upon himself. Now, he is not using profanity. He is saying, may God smite me dead if I'm lying. That sort of a thing. Calling curses down on himself. This is really serious stuff. And at that moment, Jesus is being brought out to go to his next location of kangaroo court trial. And he catches Peter's eye while Peter is saying, I don't know him. May God kill me or curse me if I'm lying. And you know what Jesus did to Peter. Killed him. No! (laughs) He loved him and he restored him. Just a side note, and I'm going to tell you this because maybe it's not anybody in this room or maybe it is somebody in this room, but certainly somebody who might be listening on another means, CD or what have you. If you have walked away from God, he wants you back and he will tree you until you come down. But you don't know what I've done. I was a Christian and I denied him. What did Jesus do with Peter? who not only denied him, lied, and caught eye contact with Jesus as he was doing it. And Peter, you say, well, he came back. He was repentant. He went out and wept bitterly. He did. He most certainly did. But you can tell all the way up until the day of Pentecost, he was much quieter. He was not bold. And you can tell that At least in places, he was terribly despondent. Even after Jesus restored him, as Jesus was risen from the dead, and he met them up in Galilee, met them on the beach, the shore of the Sea of Galilee, and he ate with them, and he talked with them. And there, Peter, do you love me? Yes, Lord, you know I'm your friend. Peter, do you love me? Yes, Lord, you know I'm your friend. Peter, are you my friend? Yes, Lord, you know all things. That's the words of a despondent man who can't get the words out because I know what I've done. I know how bad I've been. I know how horribly I've sinned and you saw me and you made eye contact with me. He can't quite get the words out. Jesus restored him. And still, 
He's walking on eggshells until the Holy Spirit comes upon him. And now he stands in the front and facing this semicircular group of men. Same guys that railroaded Jesus to the cross. The same guards took him from the same contingency anyway that took Jesus on the night of his arrest. If you were Peter, what would you be doing? If you were Peter, what would be going through your head? Uh (sighs) Uh-oh. Boy, it was fun while it lasted. (laughs) Look at all those people that came to salvation. They were encouraged, now were arrested. Oh. You ever seen crucifixion? Oh, oh, no. Here we go. Wait. Verse 8. Then Peter, filled with the Holy Spirit, said to them, filled with the Holy Spirit. He said to them, and he's polite, rulers and elders of the people. That's polite. He didn't go, you bunch of turkeys, you kill them. (laughs) You and rulers and elders of the people. He's filled with the Holy Spirit, and he just starts preaching again. If we are being called into account today for an act of kindness shown to a cripple and are asked how he was healed, then know this, you and everyone else in Israel, that is a bold statement. It is by the name of Jesus Christ or Jesus, remember, get yourself in their heads, Jesus the Messiah of Nazareth. We call him Christ because it's a Greek word. But back then it would have been Mashiach, Messiah. He's saying the Messiah that they already knew. You killed. We did it in his name, and this man was healed. And he was born that way. Remember, this is a big deal. Now, I want to show you something with another completely different passage of Scripture. Peter gives this message. The transformation that comes over Peter is not because God rewrote his personality. He's still Peter. And good old Peter really still knows how to put his foot in his mouth. And he does it a few times in the book of Acts. It's recorded in Galatians by the Apostle Paul. He makes a mess of things. Still, he is capable of doing that. Even a spirit-filled man can make mistakes and get off base. It's not the Holy Spirit's fault. Never is. He doesn't do that. But sometimes we think we know better or know more than God. Or God is with me, therefore I can say these things and do these things without praying about them and seeking the Scriptures. And you've got a problem. I want you to turn with me for a whole chapter. A whole chapter, okay? Matthew chapter 10. It's a long chapter, but I'm going to read it on my iPad here because I was able to emphasize certain verses that I'm not going to mark up on my Bible there because it would make a big mess out of my Bible. But I want to read this chapter, and I'm going to emphasize a few things here because Jesus... In Matthew 10, and if you want to read the parallel passage, it's almost the same with a few extra details put in. Luke chapter 10. Very easy. He's about to send his disciples out, two by two. And he's telling them, there are a lot of things I want you to do, and there are some rules here. And I want to give you some warnings and some encouragements. Now, knowing what I just told you, what we just talked about, Peter, John, the Sanhedrin, getting arrested. Uh, All the troubles that they've been through and now filled with the Holy Spirit. And they seem to have it all together. And suddenly, man, they're filled with the Holy Spirit and they're arrested. And they might be on trial for their lives. They might end up in front of Pilate. Listen to what Jesus told them years before. A couple of years before. Verse 1, Matthew 10. He called his 12 disciples. Now, there are others there, by the way. 
He's talking, when, he, when Jesus talks and he, he talked to his disciples, he starts with the 12, but that doesn't mean there's not a lot of other people there, and there were. But he teaches them, everybody else is welcome to listen. That was their procedures in those days with all the rabbis back in those days. He called his 12 disciples to him and he gave them authority. Jesus gives them authority to drive out evil spirits, to heal every disease and sickness. That's a lot of authority. And the Holy Spirit hasn't yet come on them. But it doesn't mean it's not a work of the Spirit. It doesn't mean the world is devoid of the work of the Holy Spirit before Pentecost. Something else happened there. But the Lord is going to do this. And so he gives the names of the 12 apostles in the next few verses. And then down in verse 5, these 12, Jesus sent out with the following instructions. Now follow me on this. Watch this. First of all, he says, do not go among the Gentiles or enter any of the town of the Samaritans. Why? Are they bad? No. He says, go to the, rather to the lost sheep of Israel. I want you to concentrate on just the Jewish people. Not because God rejects the other ones. He'll get to them. I just want you to concentrate on the Jews. Verse 7. As you go, here it is, preach this message. The kingdom of God, heaven is near. What's Peter and John doing? What's Peter doing? John's standing there. Peter's kind of the mouthpiece. It's kind of a, almost seems like a Moses and Aaron arrangement, doesn't it? It does. You know, Moses didn't do much of the talking. Aaron did most of the talking. Yeah, you look at you know, the movies, and Charlton Heston does all the talking. No, Charlton Heston would be cowering in the background while Aaron's up there talking. As you go, preach this message. The kingdom of heaven is near. Heal the sick. What happened? Peter healed the sick, didn't he? He's preaching the kingdom of heaven. He healed the sick, raised the dead. He hasn't got to that yet. Cleanse those who have leprosy, drive out demons. He hasn't gotten to that yet. Freely you have received. Freely give. Don't hold back anything, he says. How about this one? Do not take along any gold or silver or any copper in your belts. Silver and gold have I none, but such as I have, I give to you in the name of Jesus Christ of Nazareth, rise and walk. Huh. Take no bag for the journey or no extra tunic, sandals or staff, or a worker is worthy of his keep. Whatever town or village you enter, search for some worthy person there and stay at his house until you leave. That's Middle Eastern hospitality, by the way. That's a really neat study in itself. As you enter the home, give it your greeting. If the home is deserving, let your peace rest on it. If not, let your peace return to you. Once again, that's a Middle Eastern hospitality thing we'll get into now. But look at verse 14. Look at verse 14. If anyone will not welcome you or listen to your words, shake the dust off your feet when you leave the, that home or town. I tell you the truth, it will be more bearable for Sodom and Gomorrah on the day of judgment for that town. Where is Peter and John? They're in Jerusalem. And these guys who are Jews, they're preaching to the Jews. Here Jesus has preached to the Jews. The Sadducees are Jews. They're not only Jews, they're the highest higher-ups you can get. Peter, and, and Jesus says to Peter and the guys, they'll be in big trouble. You're going to be brought before these guys, Jesus told them, as we began today in John. You will be stood up before these people, and they will judge you. Understand that their judgment is a lot bigger and a lot badder. And God doesn't revel in that. But it's encouraging to know that when... You are, because you are a Christian, because you have a testimony, not because you messed up and did something stupid or bad that you're called up before the boss or whatever, but when you are put in front of people because you are a Christian, and more and more and more are we not seeing that today in our own country. Except now it's not just councils and panels. It's now social media, and that can be deadly to a person's life, to their reputation, to their job, to everything. But it'll be more bearable for Sodom and Gomorrah on the Day of Judgment than it will be for that town. 
Contextually, Jesus is talking about where they're going. But the truth is, the bottom line is, that what the people do to you, they will be held accountable for. And whatever happens to you will be far less than if they don't repent what will happen to them. Is that a threat? You better believe it. Because God is in a position to do that. Does he do it because he's mean? No, he does it because he's just and because he's right and because he sees right through the situation that which nobody else can see. Verse 16, I am sending you out like sheep, sheep among wolves. Guess what? They're on the Temple Mount. They're Galilean fishermen. They talk with that funny accent. And here comes the Sadducees, who are these hyper-educated men who are in charge of the most important Jewish thing in the world. And he, Jesus says they're like wolves. Therefore, be as shrewd as snakes and innocent as doves. Let nothing be able to be hung on you. Verse 17, be on your guard against men. They will hand you over to local councils and flog you in their synagogues. Synagogues, in case you didn't know, were also uh, like a community center. We would, up here, we'd say it's like a grange or the Odd Fellows Hall or the Veterans Hall or something like that. That's how they would characterize a synagogue. You say, well, wait a minute. I thought it was like a Jewish church. Well, in a sense, it's like that too. It is a religious center. They would keep scrolls there or whatever, but also if you needed to have like just a, a, some sort of like, a, let's say, a city council meeting or something, you could have it there. If you needed to dispense social justice, not in the sense that we think of it, but like, you know, you just needed to administer justice to somebody who had committed a misdemeanor or broke the Jewish law, you would do it there too. They actually had men in the synagogue that worked with rabbis that if they determined that you did some sort of a sin and that it demanded that you be punished corporally, they would arrange for you to be flogged. And they had guys that came in and did it inside the synagogue. Can you imagine somebody being flogged here in the sanctuary? I hope not. But that's what they could do in a synagogue. If you ever go to the Middle East or go to Israel or something, you walk into a synagogue, I can guarantee you that people have been flogged in there. It's the way they meted out justice. Guess what? You love the synagogue. You love being a part of it. They did their Jewish. Come on. Jesus used the synagogues all the time, preached at every one of them in Galilee. But he said, they're going to turn on you. They're going to put you out of the synagogues. We started when we read that earlier. And here too. They're going to beat you in them. The temple is what the synagogues all represented. Whenever you saw a synagogue, it was just a facsimile of the temple away from the temple because you couldn't move the temple around. Uh, you ever know why they call synagogues temple? A synagogue isn't a temple. And yet if you talk to a Jewish person today, maybe that's you. You say, well, I, I go to temple. They call it that because it's a representation of the temple, but it is not the temple. Verse 19, oh, excuse me, verse 18. On my account, you'll be brought before governors and kings as witnesses to them and to the Gentiles. They're being brought not before governors and kings, but definitely before the guys who run the whole thing, the, the, the Sanhedrin who run the Temple Mount, the Sadducees especially. But when they arrest you, here it comes. Do not worry about what to say or how to say it. At that time, you will be given what to say, for it will not be you speaking, but the Spirit of your Father speaking through you. That's precisely what's happening in Acts 4. Then, filled with the Holy Spirit, Peter said, and what comes out of his mouth when you read the rest of this Obviously, we are not going to finish this today, but that wasn't my intent either. So I'm off the hook, right? <laughs> what he says next is not typical of Fisherman Peter, the guy who just can't say anything right, and the guy that tends to be very self-promoting. All he does is say, Jesus did this. And it was him. And he was the Messiah. This is what he did. Peter 
when he got in front of these guys, didn't, they said, by whose authority and name did you do this? Let me pull out my script here. I'm going to read you my sermon. He was filled with the Spirit, and he said what God wanted him to say. And it astonished the Sadducees. They didn't like it, and they didn't like them. But it astonished them nonetheless, as you will see when we get through what what Peter said. But it's interesting to me that according to Jesus here in Matthew 10, also over in Luke 10, this is probably exactly what he's saying. When you're brought up before people that are going to make your knees knock together because they have so much power in a world that didn't work under the American Constitution, but under Imperial Rome, and sometimes under religious mandate, which can be more terrible than Imperial Rome if mishandled, which it frequently was, says, don't worry. Don't worry what you're going to say or how you're going to say it. And that's what Peter does. God's got something to say through you. Well, I'm not a pastor, I'm not a preacher, and I'm certainly not Peter. Doesn't matter. It doesn't matter. When the Holy Spirit is at work in you, He may put you in some very, very difficult circumstances where you are being prompted, forced, perhaps to defend where you stand with God. Perhaps even to defend Him. I don't want you to answer me on this and don't raise your hands. But would you know how to do it? See, there are seminars, courses, books by the thousands on here's how you can defend Christianity. They're good. Read them. Know it. Here's how you can prove Jesus actually rose from the dead. In a court of law, I could prove it. And I'm no lawyer. But it's easy to prove if you know, well, just learn a little bit. That's great. But what if you're not there? I've never done that. I don't intend to. I mean, I'm simple. Or maybe you can't even read well. Maybe you can't even read at all. What could I do? Don't worry about it. You will know what to say and how to say it at that moment. Well, I want to be prepared. Good idea. What if you can't be? And usually when we find ourselves put on the spot about the Lord, we are not ready for it. We didn't get up that morning saying, I think about 1230 today, I'm going to be really put on the spot about the Lord, so I better bone up on this. No, it's going to come at you out of left field. And when it does, it could be scary. What am I going to say? How am I going to say it? And who's Jesus talking to? Disciples. Well, if you look at the statues and the paintings of these guys that have been produced over the centuries from the, you know, the Middle Ages on and what have you, these guys are super saints. They should have a red cape with a big S on the back of it or something because, man, they're the saints of Jesus. Look, if you had followed these guys around, you would have smelled fish. They're not articulate. All of them seem to be somehow in the range of what you would call in those days middle class, which was kind of rare. Which means they probably knew how to read, all of them. I can't guarantee all of them knew how to read. Nobody can, because we don't know about a lot of the disciples. But the fact is, they're plain, ordinary Georgetown folks. They're from Cool, in Greenwood, in Kelsey, in Garden Valley, in Volcanoville, in Quintet, and everything in between. They're simple guys. None of these guys are from the big city. They're not from Jerusalem. 
What are they going to say? And even the council's probably looking down their nose at him. We got him now. We'll just ask him the question. We got him. We're going to nail him. And Peter opens his mouth, and what comes out devastates them. Because it wasn't Peter. It was the Holy Spirit. When you're talking to a relative, a neighbor, a friend, you have a day when you've got to stand up before people and you've got to tell them something about Jesus because you were suddenly thrust into that position just like Jesus told his disciples they would be under their circumstances. It could happen in ours. What are you going to say? Don't worry about it. And I'm a worrier. <laughs> Here I sit and I'm talking about this mainly because I don't think you guys have rocks in your pockets. <laughs> Or, or rotten fruit. But the truth is, there are those who do. What will you say and how will you say it? I don't know what I'm going to say when I get there. I don't know what I'm going to say to them. Oh, man, they've been playing with my head. I know that, man, they just hate Jesus, and, and, and i got to go visit with these people, or, or whatever. Fill in the blank. You know, you're thinking, well... Jay, what about this example? Yeah, everybody's got about five different examples, and maybe some of them are coming upon you now, this afternoon or soon. What are you going to say? Don't worry about it. You have the same Holy Spirit in you as Peter, as Jesus. Well, I don't know how to witness. You have the same Holy Spirit in you as Peter, as Jesus, as the early church on the day of Pentecost, same Holy Spirit. But I don't have any scriptures memorized. Every one of you, I think, can probably offer a story or a testimony. I was talking to somebody, and this scripture just fell right out of my mouth. And I didn't even know I knew it. There's a reason for that. Who wrote the book? It was inspired by the Holy Spirit. And that scripture comes out of your mouth and it was perfect. A word of wisdom comes out of your mouth and it's perfect because I'm not that smart. Where did that come from? The people around you, their jaws drop going, I never thought of that before. It's the Holy Spirit. This is what he does. Jesus promised his disciples. Are you his disciples? Are you his disciples? Yes. Yes. Just wanted to make sure you knew that and that you're, you know, those of you that are nodding off, you stay awake until I'm done. <laughs> we are his disciples. Oh, I know we're not the same as the 12. But we are his disciples. And the Holy Spirit doesn't have a special Holy Spirit for them and a different one for you. I just want to encourage you with that. Uh, let me read on a little bit more and we'll wrap this up. Uh, verse 21, uh, but brother will betray brother to death and a father his child. Children will rebel against their parents and have them put to death. Boy, it's going to get bad for these disciples. I don't know if any of you have had anything like that happen, but it's extremely rare in this country when you do hear anything like that happen. All men will hate you because of me, Jesus said. But please don't forget, we already read, they're going to hate you, but it's nothing personal. They hate you because you're with me. What is the issue in politics that we have today? You can name all of these different hot buttons in politics, but ultimately it comes down to Christian morality and ethics, which underpins our government and the way we live here, and we're in the process politically of eliminating that from our lives. Those are the adjustments that are going on. That's the big picture. That is the really big picture by the people who are in power at the moment who don't happen to like that. And the people who are in power who do like it but are not willing to stand up that strongly for it because they don't want to be perceived as religious or with Jesus. See, so this is what's going on. Jesus, he nailed it. He's pretty smart. Well, being God in human form works well that way. All men will hate you because of me, but he who stands firm to the end will be saved. When you are persecuted in one place, flee to another. Yeah, if persecution breaks out, it's okay to go someplace else. We're not worried about that here right now, unless you live in California or you're going to Idaho or something. <laughs> I know, I know, I'm sorry, I just had to say it. Okay. 
I tell you the truth, you will not finish going through the cities of Israel before the Son of Man comes. A student is not above his teacher, nor a servant above his master. Listen, here's another one. It is enough for the student to be like his teacher and the servant to be like his master. Oh, so what's the deal with that? You're going to see at the end of what Peter says to the Sadducees next week when we get there, that they were astonished at Peter and John and perceived that they were unlearned men. They hadn't been to college. They weren't seminarians. They weren't Bible college students. But the more important thing is because of their boldness, they perceived that they had been with Jesus. We don't have to worry about being with Jesus. He's with us. By his spirit, he's in you. And when we're with each other, we're with Jesus. Because he's in there, and 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 he's in there. And isn't God conforming us from glory to glory and by the power of his spirit into the likeness of his son, Jesus Christ? Huh. It is enough for the student to be like his teacher. Here you sit. And the servant, like his master. Jesus hadn't washed their feet yet. That was going to be at least a year or so away. Maybe a couple of years away. Jesus is not your servant, but he serves. And he taught us how to do that. That's his nature. Oh, man, that's five sermons right there. If the head of the house had been called Beelzebub, how much more it's members of his household. He's talking about those who hate him. So let me finish this. So don't be afraid, verse 26. Don't be afraid of them. Are you afraid of what you're going to have to say? Are you afraid of giving your testimony? Are you afraid of teach, preaching the gospel? Are you afraid of saying the word Jesus, that radioactive word that when brought up in public is worse than using every profanity in the book? Don't be afraid of them. There is nothing concealed that will not be disclosed or hidden that will not be made known. What I tell you in the dark, speak in the daylight. What is whispered in your ear, proclaim from the roofs. Once again, do not be afraid of those who kill the body but cannot kill the soul. He's telling this to the disciples. He's telling it to Peter. Where is Peter in the book of Acts? Standing before the guys that can do just that. Suddenly, this is all being fulfilled. It's like a prophecy. Do you see it now? That's why I love this passage. It's incredible. Rather be afraid of the one who can destroy both, both body and soul. Are not two sparrows sold for a penny, verse 29? Yet not one of them will fall to the ground apart from your father, and even the very hairs on your head are numbered. So he says it again. How many times has he said it? Do not be afraid. You are worth more than many sparrows. Whoever acknowledges me before men, I will acknowledge him before my father in heaven. But whoever disowns me before men, I will disown him before my father in heaven. There's a lot more in that passage then I want to go into right now. Don't create any weird doctrines off of it, okay? But Jesus is telling the disciples, acknowledge me before men. Don't be afraid to do that. The ones that disown me before men, your enemies, I'll disown them before heaven. That's all that's going on in there. We can go a lot deeper. But the deal is, speak up. Well, what will happen to me? Don't be afraid of that. Tell people about Jesus. Love people like Jesus. Don't be afraid. Don't be afraid. Then he says, do not suppose that I have come to bring peace to the earth. I didn't come to bring peace but a sword. It's going to get rough. It's going to get rough, but skipping down, verse 38. And if anyone who does not take up his cross and follow me is not worthy of me, whoever finds his life will lose it. Whoever loses his life for my sake will find it. For he who receives you receives me, and he who receives me receives the one who sent me. Oh, there's so much more I could say in that passage, but I wanted to point out that when Jesus told the guys this before he sent them out, these are the rules. As you read right here in the book of Acts, chapter 4, verse 8. 
Then Peter, filled with the Holy Spirit, said to them, rulers and elders of the people, Jesus said, you're going to stand before these guys and they'll be able to hurt you. Don't be afraid. If we are being called into account today for an act of kindness showed to a cripple and asked how he was healed, you have been given the authority to heal, to raise from the dead, to do all of these things. Then know this, you and everyone else in Israel, you go to the lost sheep of Israel. It is by the name of Jesus Christ of Nazareth, whom you crucified. You hated him, but whom God raised from the dead, that this man stands before you completely healed. He's obviously not afraid of Jesus now. He's obviously not denying his name now, while he was even in the high priest's house at one point when he did that. And it gets better. This is how God wrote the Bible. We read the scriptures in little tiny bites, but there is this vast, wonderful landscape with all these things happening on it, with all these roads and trails that intersect each other that is not complicated. It's as simple as it gets. And what Peter is doing is simply what Jesus had already trained them to do with the same rules, with the same encouragements, with the same warnings. Here's what's going to happen. And you are looking at Peter fulfilling in front of these guys exactly what Jesus had already drilled them on and what he said would happen and I wonder if they really even believed it back then. I wonder if they even believed it. And yet, here is Peter, and it's happening just as Jesus said. And that brings us to you. Here you are too. You're no Peter. Be glad. You can probably and have probably been doing things a lot better than he would have done at least when he wasn't filled with the Holy Spirit. And you have the same Holy Spirit. Don't be afraid. Don't be afraid. Don't be afraid to speak his name. Don't be afraid to pray for people. Don't be afraid to share the gospel, preach the gospel. What will they do to me? Don't be afraid. Well, what if they do things? They will do things. What if they say bad things? They will say bad things. It's not our goal to keep people from doing bad things or saying bad things about us. Our goal is obedience. And that comes successfully by walking filled with the Holy Spirit. Oh, that's such a simple message. And how many times has it been preached here? A thousand? More? But don't be afraid. Look at Peter. Jesus already said, look at John, or rather uh, Matthew 10. Look at John 15. Here it's happening. And it will happen again. When God puts you in a place, watch what the Holy Spirit does. I love it. And he'll do it right every single time. Thank you, Lord. Thanks for this great, great passage of Scripture. Thank you so much for preparing the disciples' hearts and ours from what you taught long before the moments that we're even reading about today there in the presence of the Sadducees and the Sanhedrin with Peter and John. And yet, Lord, you said these things we can preach about them and agree with them, but now we see them in action as these guys get up in front after spending the night in jail and opening their mouths and not knowing what was going to come out next. And Lord, it was so perfect because you did it. And here we read about it 2,000 years later. And it still speaks to us. 
and you speak to us, and you empower us. O oh Lord, give us boldness. Take away our fears, and may we walk in you, believe you, take up our cross, and follow you. In Jesus' name, and everyone said, Amen. Amen.